The GeoBook NB60, a unique little laptop computer introduced in the late 1990s to provide a low-cost alternative to the rising popularity in laptop computers. During this time, an average laptop computer would set you back anywhere from two to $5,000, far too much for the average home user or student to justify. This left a space in the market for ultra-budget laptop computers for those consumers who were not sure how useful a more expensive laptop would be, or for those who simply needed a cheap word processor for school or personal use. The GeoBook appears to have been mostly a flop, considering info on these is very sparse. I was lucky enough to find a GeoBook NB60 new in box on eBay for a reasonable price, which included all the original software and documentation. In this video, we'll take a look at the original packaging, manuals, etc., followed by an overview and demonstration of the GeoBook. In the name of preservation, I'll probably try to upload some disk images, along with any of the custom tweaks I make to the laptop, and we'll see what it was like using this strange little laptop computer. The first thing I found out was the included promotional cutout that you could stick to the laptop. I guess they were really pushing for retailers to put these on display. Everything was boxed quite securely, and they did include a lot in the box. There are multiple manuals, quick start guides, diskettes, and order forms for accessories such as additional batteries, chargers, or memory expansions. The GeoBook is a very plain looking, very chunky, beige laptop. Considering how much empty space is inside this, I assume they made it larger for ease of assembly and to make it look more similar to its higher cost competitors. In fact, just by removing the keyboard, you can see basically the entirety of the inside. It has a fairly small motherboard, two battery packs, and a standard desktop floppy drive. The display is a monochrome backlit passive matrix panel, which is not great by any means, but for the tasks it was built for, it's good enough. The hinges are... Eh, not great. In fact, the way the display cable is routed is a huge problem with these units. After only a handful of times opening it, the flat flex cable started to crack, causing loss of display. I could have bought a newer flat flex cable to replace it, but opted to replace it with my own wiring harness using a salvaged VGA cable. This actually improved the video quality as well on my unit. The keyboard is pretty decent, it's probably one of the better aspects of the GeoBook, which is a smart move considering word processing is probably the most likely usage of this computer. The trackpad is absolutely terrible, as were most 90s trackpads, but it gets the job done. The rubber coating on mine was cracked and peeling, so I removed it and replaced it with this faux carbon fiber vinyl sheet, which feels much nicer to use. The GeoBook was not a powerhouse by any means, even by 1998 standards. To cut costs, the GeoBook used system on a chip technology, a technology still used today by small electronics, such as smartphones and tablets. Instead of having a separate processor, chipset, and graphics, all these functions are combined into one single package. The main system chip, the AMD ELAN SC3000, features a 386SX processor clocked at 33 MHz and integrates a memory controller. DMA controllers, interrupt controllers, real-time clock, serial, parallel ports, and PCMCIA slots. It seems these chipsets were intended more for industrial type of applications. Things like the system boards for industrial machinery or terminals for basic controls. The system I have, the NB60, only has 4 megabytes of system memory and 1 megabyte of flash storage. This sort of hardware configuration is nowhere near enough to run Windows, but the GeoBook had a few tricks up its sleeve. Instead of using Windows, the GeoBook runs an alternative operating system called GEOS, a graphical interface which sits on top of DOS. The GEOS operating system is one of the reasons I find the GeoBook such an interesting device, and I've made a few modifications to the system to bring back functionality not found in the original product. Normally the system boots up to a simple Brother branded landing screen, which can launch any of the built-in applications one at a time in full screen. In fact, the default configuration resembles more of a pocket organizer style interface than a full-blown OS of the day. However, by adding alternative configuration files in the flash memory, the system reads this instead of the built-in configuration, allowing me to change the default shell. The default shell boots up slower, but allows me to run multiple applications at once, windowed or full screen. I can also add additional programs to the launcher. The system runs a version of DOS called Data Lite ROM DOS. In theory, this expands the capabilities of the machine greatly by allowing MS-DOS compatibility. In practice, though, 
many programs I've tried, especially games, simply do not work correctly or just crash on the machine. One particular bug I have not been able to get around involves the keyboard. It appears that the system uses some sort of non-standard keyboard, because most of the games I've tried do not correctly respond to key presses. I'll occasionally get some keys to register, but they often repeat or do strange things when they do register. This, the this means that almost any games I've tried were entirely unplayable due to the lack of controls, which is disappointing to say the least, as a Tiny386 machine would have been great for some of the more simple DOS era games without having to set up a full desktop. I actually kind of love the Geos interface. It's very simple and reminds me of Windows 3.1. In fact, the system could very easily be mistaken for Windows 3.1. It uses a similar launcher and minimizes programs to icons on the desktop. While there are not nearly as many applications available, the ones that are included are actually quite useful. The Office Suite is extremely capable, with a wonderfully intuitive interface to anyone who's ever used Microsoft Word. Likewise, the spreadsheet and drawing programs are also very capable. If it were easier to transfer files to modern machines, I could see myself using this as a distraction-free computer for word processing even today. In fact, I actually decided to use this for some of my scripts. My script for my PG-22 was actually written partially on this laptop. Instead of trying to get DOS programs working, I went on the hunt for more Geos programs. There seems to be a small following of PC Geos fans, and I did find a few add-on and homebrew applications. One of the more useful add-on programs is a simple terminal emulator. It has a few options for line count, terminal type, etc., and I've been able to do some fun things like connect to Cisco routers for programming and such. I can even connect to my Raspberry Pi Zero, which gives me a full Linux shell. So I wanted to try to connect the Geobook to the internet, and see if I could use it for anything remotely useful. Of course, I'm not going to use this as a daily driver or anything, but I figured it'd be fun to try to use it for something remotely useful. I ended up using a Raspberry Pi Zero W to act as the bridge between the Geobook and the outside world. Of course, I can simply use the serial terminal to directly log into the Raspberry Pi, which allows me to use it as a tiny Linux machine. And while this is definitely the most useful method, as I get a full Linux-capable machine, it's sort of cheating, as the Geobook isn't really doing a whole lot of work, and it's just acting as a dumb terminal. I can also set up the Raspberry Pi to emulate a modem, in this mode, the Raspberry Pi emulates a standard serial modem and parses phone numbers as IP addresses. This allows me to use the serial terminal to dial a BBS through a Telnet connection. This feels a lot more like something which could have been done when the Geobook was new, using a modem to dial up to a BBS, although it's still not using the Geobook to its full potential. Luckily, the Geobook also supports dial-up PPP connections. I can set up the Raspberry Pi to intercept a certain phone number and form a PPP connection with the Geobook. To the Geobook, it looks like it's using a standard serial modem to log into an ISP, while the Raspberry Pi routes all the internet traffic over Wi-Fi. This allows me to truly experience what could have been done on a Geobook back in the day. With this method, I can very, very, very slowly load websites with the built-in browser. I can connect to an email server and I can even use an IRC client. Unfortunately, most email servers will not be supported as it cannot use modern, modern encryption methods, and um, nobody really uses IRC anymore. In fact, when I logged in, I couldn't find a single person on. Although honestly, this could be due to a broken implementation of the IRC protocol on here that just isn't supporting the servers I'm connecting to. But hey, at least we got something working. Well, even though it's absolutely the most useless machine in my collection, I still love it. It's not particularly useful nowadays, and I can't even really play any sort of games on it, but it's just such a weird little machine that it stands out as one of my favorites. It has specifications that were 10 years out of date when it was released, it's rather cheaply made, and it's ugly as all heck. But the fact that it exists at all and tried to put computing in the hands of more people is kind of admirable. I'd like to eventually move the Raspberry Pi into the actual computer so I don't have to power it externally, although maybe I'll just keep it as is. I think it'd be pretty funny to bring it somewhere like a Starbucks and fire up SSH to work on my web servers or write future scripts on it. If you have any questions or comments about this odd little machine, please let me know, and if you want to see more videos like this, please like and subscribe to my channel. I'd like to put out a couple more videos of some of my other retro computers in my collection, including another slightly more useful 386 machine. 
Well, hopefully you found this video entertaining and thanks for watching.